All right. So, hi everybody. It's my total pleasure and honor to welcome you to our much more than 10th, this is a typo, um, bi biological physics and uh, physical biology virtual seminar series um, organized by myself, Momita Das, <coughs> Kimberly uh, Beerich, and Meredith Bereton. Um, today we have two treats. First talk, what can thermodynamics teach us from biology from Massimiliano Esposito from University of Luxembourg. And the second talk, the apples fall far from the tree, layers of heterogeneity and stress tolerance in tuber tubercle bacilli from Brie Aldridge from Tufts University. You guys are all experts in the seminar etiquette. We'll also put them into the chat. So I'm not going to walk through the details of the seminar etiquette. For the time being, please mute yourselves. Um, and when it's time for questions, of course, um, we can have an extended conversation. Um, with that, I would like to turn this over to uh, Massimiliano. Um, without further ado, what can thermodynamics teach us about biology? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will share my screen. Ah, yes, I can share. Okay. Now you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I will start. So thank you very much for this, uh, giving me this opportunity and, and also for organizing this uh, very interesting seminar series. So I thank all the organizers for that. Um, so, um, what I'm going to try to do is give you an idea about how I'm trying to use thermodynamics to be able to say something about biology. Um, and, you know, we, there are little, not many universal things that we can say about biology, but uh, I think one uh, statement that is for sure true is that uh, biological processes are a paradigmatic uh, non-equilibrium phenomena. So everything in biology is out of equilibrium and it's a non-equilibrium uh, process. So from a physics standpoint, uh, it makes it quite natural to use thermodynamic as a first attempt uh, to identify uh, general uh, things uh, in biology. So I will try to say right away uh, to answer right away the question I ask, namely, what can thermodynamics teach us about biology, and then say where I think we are uh, in the process of answering that question. So I think from a more biological perspective, uh, the very interesting question for me is to assess to what extent uh, energetic consideration have shaped uh, biological evolution. And I think this is a very open and very interesting uh, question. From a slightly more physical perspective, uh, one may wonder if biological processes are special from a thermodynamic point of view. Um, is there something that distinguish them from other non-equilibrium processes? And I think to what extent this may be true is also a very interesting open question. But of course, uh, I don't think I will be able to answer those questions uh, today. Uh, these are more questions I would like to answer. And um, what I'm, what I'm going to focus instead uh, on today is um, the, the theory that we need in order to be able to answer those questions. So I think we also need many more experiments that will work on thermodynamics of biological system but uh, I will focus on what we can do at the theory level because we also need to develop a thermodynamic theory that can describe uh, biological systems. So as you know, traditional thermodynamics deals with uh, macroscopic system close to equilibrium. And it's actually not really a thermodynamics, it's more a thermostatics. Time is not naturally coming into the theory, can be built in a kind of ad hoc way. But what we would like is, is a, a theory that can really be built on dynamics so that times is, is built in because biology is all about processes. 
Um, we all, I would also like to have a theory that um, is valid at any scale, starting from the scale where biological complexity emerges, emer emerges namely the, the molecular scale. Fluctuations are very important there. And also far from equilibrium, because biological processes are typically far from equilibrium. Um, and I think this, uh, what I'm gonna tell you today is that basically this we have, and um, I'm, the, the challenge that I think we partially start to understand but is more open is to deal with the many layers of complexity because what a distinctive feature of biological system is that complexity is, is really organized at many different levels and each of these levels is away from equilibrium. And this is something that is challenging and um, I will come back to that in my conclusion. So uh, what I'm planning to do today is to first briefly tell you about stochastic thermodynamics, the, the basic theory. Um, that's a thermodynamics for small system far from equilibrium, which deals uh, with the, which can describe the molecular machine, machinery of cells. That's the level where it applies. Um, and I will show you how interesting results from, from this theory can be used uh, and should be relevant for biology, namely how entropy production or dissipation can be used to bound uh, precision and speed. These are the so-called thermodynamic uncertainty relations. Then I will apply this to the problem of substrate inhibition in uh, uh, Michaelis Menten kinetics. Then I will move to a higher level, uh, which is the level of the uh, chemical reaction network described by deterministic uh, rate equations. So that's a, I'm not anymore at the stochastic level. I'm at a level where there are many molecules and we're dealing with uh, nonlinear uh, dynamical equations and we want to build a, a thermodynamic theory on top of that. I will give you the, the very briefly the basic theory and show you how in the context of reaction diffusion we can use this to assess the cost, the minimal cost uh, to build a, a chemical pattern or to propagate a chemical wave. And then I will finally uh, say some words about how at both level, the stochastic one and the deterministic one, we can use this new formulation of, of non-equilibrium thermodynamics to study energy transduction in finite time. And then I will conclude and give some perspective after that. So let's start. Stochastic thermodynamics. So the theory is, as I said, applies to the molecular machinery of the cell. So that's, I'm, I'm gonna always show this molecular motor there. The picture you should have is a, a system where I can identify some states. Uh, these states are uh, these uh, dots here. And um, I'm dealing with a stochastic dynamics that uh, describes transition between those states. So this is the framework the, that I'm gonna use is the, the master equation. These are uh, rates, the probability per unit time to jump from a state J to a state I via a mechanism new. Uh, you can think of that as different reservoirs, this index of the reservoir. And you see, I can jump between two states via two different uh, mechanisms. So uh, I will assume that each of these states can have an internal structure, but that internal structure needs to be at equilibrium. That's why I can assign an energy or a free energy to each of these states. That's a strong assumption, and that's related to this uh, question of one layer of complexity versus many layer. I will come back to that at the end. Uh, the second one is that what uh, triggers transition between those states are reservoirs which are at equilibrium. And so they are defined by uh, equilibrium property like temperature, chemical potential, and these two assumptions uh, form the, the key assumption uh, to connect the stochastic dynamics to the energetics and it's called the local detail balance, which can be justified microscopically, but I'm not gonna enter that discussion is the fact that the logarithm of the forward rate and the backward rate for a given mechanism must be related to the heat transfer between that transition. So you see that what appears here is a difference of energy in the system or free energy in the system. 
minus potentially some work that has been provided uh, by the external world during that transition. And this difference between energy and work is a, is a heat. And so by identifying <coughs> this uh, quantity at the level of the rate, every rate that is thermodynamically consistent needs to satisfy this property, we can really build uh, a formulation of uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics on top of these stochastic dynamics. I will not go into the detail, but the, the, the essence of the, the procedure is to look at energy, which is an expectation value of the energy, build an entropy, which you see is an expectation uh, value of the internal entropy of each state, but also has this Shannon contribution uh, with a log P uh, uh, contribution to the, to the entropy. Uh, and then the, I can form a free energy, that, which is a non-equilibrium free energy out of this. And then what I do is I write balance equation for these things. I take the derivative of energy and the derivative of entropy, and I identify in this derivative the heat and the work. Uh, and this forms my first law. Each of these expressions has a detailed uh, ex expression in terms of the stochastic dynamics, but I, I don't have time to go into the details. And same for the entropy. And the important point about the entropy is that the difference between the change of entropy and the heat flowing to the different reservoir is this entropy production, or sometimes also called dissipation or entropy in the universe. That's the quantity that is central to any non-equilibrium formulation of thermodynamics and that is always greater or equal to zero. So that's really in a nutshell, the basics of the average description uh, of stochastic thermodynamics. Now I want to say a few words about the fact that we can go beyond simply expectation values. We can really look at fluctuations and we can define thermodynamic quantity at the fluctuating level. And the, the an important point is to realize that the, the entropy production when defined at the trajectory level, the level of the stochastic trajectory is really thinking of the little uh, three state model I showed you before. So a trajectory is a sequence of state connected by given transitions and the entropy production along a trajectory can be expressed as uh, KB times the logarithm of the probability that that trajectory happens versus the probability that the backward trajectory happens, the time reversed trajectory happens. And uh, this uh, result implies the, the famous fluctuation theorem that really triggered uh, the, the, this entire field of non-equilibrium uh, thermodynamics over the last 20 years, um, which tells us that the probability to observe uh, processes with a positive uh, uh, given entropy production sigma divided that by the probability to observe minus that entropy production always satisfy this very simple exponential uh, relation. Now, this implies, of course, the second law. So the traditional ensemble average second law. So it can be viewed as a refinement of the second law. Um, and um, I also want to comment of, uh, on now the connection between stochastic thermodynamics and information theory. And I don't want to go into too many details, simply to mention that many of the thermodynamic quantity can be expressed in terms of quantities which we are used to see in information theory. So uh, entropy production um, here, the average one is the expectation value of the trajectory one, can be written as a relative entropy this is defined here. Uh, it, you can, for those of you who are not familiar with that quantity, it's always positive and it can be seen as a measure of how different the two probability distributions are from each other. So you see that entropy production is a measure of how different is the probability to observe processes forward in time versus backward in time. And it's always positive. The, the difference between the free energy, the non-equilibrium free energy I defined before, and the equilibrium free energy can also be expressed as a relative entropy, which tells me how different is my probability distribution to its equilibrium probability distribution. So that's also another interesting connection. Uh, an obvious one is the fact that the entropy uh, of the system can be expressed as a Shannon entropy. 
And the last one, uh, this is something very important, which we can also discuss uh, at the end. It's the fact that uh, relative entropies, uh, and therefore the entropy production here, uh, when we coarse grain the probability distribution, that's what I mean by, by this little bar here. So imagine that you have a coarse grain description of your trajectory, you're gonna always underestimate the entropy production. So that's a major issue for biology uh, because quite often you don't have the full description of all the degrees of freedom which are out of equilibrium in your system, you only have a partial one. And so this is telling you that you're gonna always underestimate the entropy production if you're using such a coarse grain uh, description. Okay, so now in the last 10 minutes, I need to speed up a little bit. I, I want to tell you some results that we can get. Um, these um, uncertainty relation uh, are quite interesting, thermodynamic uncertainty relation, because they, they show that entropy production can be used to bound both uh, precision and speed. And it's quite general because it applies to any observable that is uh, anti-symmetric under time reversal. So let's think of current as an obvious one, and any current is anti-symmetric under time reversal. And we can define the precision uh, of an observable as the ratio between the square of the average divided by the variance. Then when the variance is very small, the precision is, is very high. And uh, five years ago, um, Udo Seifert uh, and Andre Barato, they found, uh, they observed that um, uh, this precision was bound by the entropy production divided by 2 kB. And later, Todd Gingrich um, with uh, Jordan Orovitz and other uh, proved uh, rigorously that results. And this gave rise to many different version and generalization of that result. Uh, including some by us. Um, and the reason why this, this relation is, is very interesting is because it really shows you that in order to realize a process uh, with a given precision P, uh, you need to dissipate at least 2 kBp um, under the form of entropy production. So any process uh, should satisfy this relation. Of course, you can be uh, very far from the bound, but it certainly gives you a uh, very uh, interesting information and uh, this information is, is universal. That's what makes it interesting. But of course, in practice, in a given system, you can use the tools of stochastic thermodynamics to actually calculate the real uh, precision of a process. Then a, a more recent one uh, that, that we discovered together with Jean Maria Palasco is this dissipation time uncertainty principle. Um, here, the picture is we have a system at steady state. We can, to make it concrete, we can think of a, a, part, a Brownian particle on a ring uh, subjected to a non-conservative force. And we want to know uh, how much time it takes to go 10 times around the ring. And, and then we define the mean uh, first passage time for that to happen. And uh, what we realized is that uh, this, pro this uh, mean first passage time satisfy this uh, uncertainty relation, which is quite appealing because it resembles the one that we are used to in quantum mechanics, but then it would be the energy here and H bar here, but that's the thermodynamic version of it. And what it tells us is the, the, that in order to realize a process in a given amount of time, at least Kb divided by T, but now it's time, it's not, temperature uh, must be dissipated. Uh, the key assumption here, um, it's still quite general, but it's that the backward process uh, much be, must be much more unlikely than the forward one. For instance, in the example of the ring, going 10 times against the bias is super, super unlikely. And so we are completely in the regime where this uh, inequality holds. If this is not satisfied, a more general version of that relation holds. So these are two very interesting uh, results that <coughs> obviously should be of relevance to understand the molecular machinery uh, of, of a cell. Now, uh, very briefly application, we have this, I, I will not go into any detail here. Let me just say that um, 
you can actually, in a given model like this one, uh, which is uh, uh, substrate inhibition, you can actually calculate the precision. And here it's actually the square root of the precision, which is the signal to noise ratio. And this is to show you that, of course, that can be quite far away from the bound. The bound is here, okay? But um, so it's to show you that it's a bound, it's not, uh, but that the, the stochastic thermodynamics can really, uh, is a tool to actually calculate the real uh, bound, the, the real uh, precision. So let me, I, I now want to move to the next level, which is the deterministic uh, level of description. And one way to introduce it uh, briefly without going into any detail is the following. We could describe chemical reactions uh, using stochastic thermodynamics, but we would work in a huge space where the stochastic variable is all the list of species, the number of, of each species, and it's a very impractical thing. And so when concentrations are large, uh, we can take a macroscopic limit of that theory and that, that stochastic thermodynamic then really gets into this deterministic formulation, which now um, applies for a dynamics, which is the deterministic dynamics of chemistry, the one that we learn in high school in terms of rate equations. And very often they are nonlinear because uh, chemistry very often deals with uh, the molecular reactions. And here we consider open chemical reactions uh, network. So by open, it means that there are some species that are supplied from the outside to the chemical reaction network. This is, these are called chemostats, like thermostats is external reservoir that fixes the temperature. Here we have chemostats. And uh, if you think of, of the cell in, in this drawing here, the chemostat would be these species here that are supplied from the outside and that make sure that the levels uh, of these concentration inside the system are held constant. And so you're supplying your system with uh, energy by putting things in it or removing things from it. This is gonna be the chemical work. And you can basically do what we did at the stochastic level at that uh, deterministic level and write a first law. Now energy is, is enthalpy and uh, a second law. And what is quite remarkable is that uh, there's a notion of information that remains at that deterministic level because now the, if you see the entropy is not anymore a Shannon entropy because these are not probability, these are deterministic concentrations, but we have nevertheless something that is very reminiscent of a Shannon entropy with this additional term that is a, 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 a consequence of the fact that uh, concentrations are not probability and so they are not normalized. Now, <clears throat> I want to immediately tell you what you can do with that theory. If you add in addition diffusion and you're dealing with reaction diffusion, the theory can help you uh, make the two following statements. Uh, the minimal cost to structure things in space, you know that in reaction, in open uh, reaction diffusing system, you can have things like uh, Turing pattern, uh, which structure, which create uh, non-homogeneous uh, uh, concentration fields. And we now have a, a specific expression, which is a, again, a kind of Kullback-Leibler uh, uh, entropy uh, that gives us the minimal cost in order to create such a spatial structuring. Okay, so we, we know that the thermodynamic cost for structuring things in space using that formula. We can also apply it to wave equation and calculate the cost needed to propagate different kinds of chemical waves. So if you, many biological systems communicate via chemical waves, if you want to assess the cost of it, you can also use this kind of theory. Uh, very fast, um, both uh, at the stochastic fast level. Fast. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but a clarification question. What is yeah. Z? What is Z? Z. Z is the concentrations. Sorry, I should have said this. So Z are the concentrations. Uh, I use X for the internal concentration and Y for the chemostat concentration and Z is the generic label for any concentration. Great, thanks. Um, now, both at the stochastic level and at the deterministic level, we can formulate uh, energy conversion using this theory and in finite time. This is really 
the, the we can assess how efficiently energy gets converted. We can do this uh, at steady state, as well as in situation where the system is growing. And the key uh, to do that is to identify uh, what are called uh, emergent cycle in our language. These are cyclic processes that have a net, that create a net change on the environment. They actually, for those of you who know the hill cycle, this is a generalization of the hill cycle. It's a more economical description of the hill cycle. And, and it really provides us the minimal decomposition of the entropy production in terms of thermodynamic forces called affinities and currents. And then based on this decomposition, you can uh, formulate energy transduction. If for instance, a current goes against the direction that is imposed by its own force, it's necessarily due to the existence of another current that goes in the direction uh, imposed by its force. And the efficiency of this energy conversion process will then be um, the output, which is the, this current going against its force, divided by the input, which is always bounded by one, which is the analog of a Carnot efficiency in isothermal systems. As I said, we can also do this for growing this system. And there, the important contribution that describes the growth is this non-equilibrium free energy. So there's a cost for putting things inside the system, growing the system, and that term uh, explicitly account for this. And here we studied a, a problem of uh, self-assembly showing that uh, at equilibrium, we essentially have uh, monomers. Um, so my time is over. I should find out, okay. Uh, but out of equilibrium, we can, um, we managed to accumulate and we can calculate the efficiency with which we do that. Do I still have a minute to conclude? Go for it. Okay, so uh, I hope I managed to uh, show you that uh, we have a thermodynamics that can allow us to study things like the cost of accuracy, of time, how much time uh, processes take, of structuring things in space, propagating signals, converting energy. But all this is basically uh, up to this level here. It's still quite uh, basic uh, in the sense that we rely on this assumption that we describe all the degrees of freedom that are out of equilibrium. All the other degrees of freedom must be at equilibrium. And if we want to go beyond, we need to go beyond that assumption. And the, this is really the, the major challenge because as I told you, coarse graining typically underestimates entropy production. So we need to find ways to have coarse grain description of a system which keep track of the correct uh, thermodynamics without underestimating entropy production. Um, and uh, I think what will be essential is to have modular way of doing that. So finding uh, coarse graining scheme that allow us to take pieces that each are out of equilibrium, put them together to have a description of how these pieces work together, again, out of equilibrium. Uh, I finally think that we need more experiments. And I think that if we manage to make progress in this direction, we will probably be able to answer these questions of this important biological question of how important uh, is energy into shaping uh, biological systems. So sorry for being a bit late and uh, thank you very much for your attention. All right, so given that we have um, less than our usual five minutes, I'm gonna to try to uh, run through a few questions uh, mm -hmm. ASAP and we'll get to the rest of them during the informal discussions. Um, so let me start with a technical question from Peter Kramer at 11.11. Um, the question is, so the FIJ race to new would yeah. be an irreversible work due to friction. I would have thought conservative work would appear already in differences in the GI if I understand their meaning correctly. I think this is approximately around slide four. Yeah, I'm there. So uh, I'm showing the slide. So. Uh, in this presentation, I chose to only have non-conservative work, uh, which you can think of as whenever you go through this transition, it's like lifting a, a weight. 
uh, or you can also think of uh, this like uh, uh, an ATP gets hydrolyzed. Um, there's the other type of work that appears in stochastic thermodynamics when the rate depends on a time dependent uh, on time, uh, on a time dependent parameter. Uh, but I decided for presentation sake not to put it in. I could have also put it in. This is only a, a way to simplify things. Great. Um, so jumping to a question from Jing Chen at 1118. Is there any rule of thumb for estimating how much underestimation of entropy production a given level of coarse graining would cause? And I want to roll into that a follow-up question from Sriram Ramaswamy at 1119. When you, so, when you say coarse grained, you could also mean low pass filtered in frequency, right? Yeah. So, uh, okay, yes. So <clears throat> uh, that's a very good uh, and difficult question. And I think many people are trying to uh, answer it. Um, I, one of the more recent uh, direction uh, is uh, Juan Paondo, who was showing that by keeping information that is not explicitly in this uh, expression about the waiting time statistics, um, you can actually improve uh, your prediction of the real entropy production. But this is really, uh, I think, a still very open uh, problem. And I don't think there's a, there's, a, there's a general way to know how far you are from the real thing. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to take uh, Take one more question from this one's from Rudra Biswas. How close are the entropy production precision lower bounds to real biological processes? I think this will depend a lot of the kind of processes that you're considering. Um, we know simple models where we can get close to the bounds and these are, if, uh, if you, consider molecular motors which are tightly coupled, so with a single uh, current times force in the entropy production, no more than one. Uh, in the linear regime, when you can expand the currents in the force, uh, you can actually uh, saturate the bound. Um, the more um, coarse grained your description is, probably the, the further away you move from, from the real uh, yeah, from uh, the, these bounds become uh, softer and softer. Um, so, so we will have an extended discussion about theory versus experiments in this context, uh, in mm -hmm. the informal discussions, but in the interest of time, I'm wrapping this, uh, this discussion and thank you again for a terrific talk. Over thank to you, Bree, would you please share your screen?